What I will say is yes, I had a profound near-death experience, profound spiritual transformation, like many of you. And I wrote a couple of best-selling books, and I've been on all kinds of talk shows and all sorts of things. But fundamentally, the question that I have to ask myself and the question that you all should ask of me and of yourselves with every experience is, so what? So what? Because an experience is only valuable if it has the power to provoke thought, provoke change, growth, especially if it pushes you in the direction of spiritual transformation and love. And so <clears throat> when I think about transformation and the, the title of this conference or the theme of this conference is the after effects, and ultimately, what a great theme because that's all that really matters. How does it really change us? How does my experience change me? And more importantly, what's in it for other people? Because as we all know, being here is not about us, it's about serving others. And so I will tell you also that transformation, as you well know, takes time, a lot of time. <laughs> and for me, it has taken many, many years. And I know that as I keep going on, I keep thinking about different aspects of my, life is, my life's experience, and that process continues and continues and continues. And I suppose my own transformation began really in medical school. I grew up as a child of the 50s in the Midwest, and I went to Sunday school, I went to confirmation, I did all those things. But back then, for me at least, it had nothing to do with spirituality. It had nothing to do with what really matters, and it had everything to do with that's what you do on Sunday morning. You go to church. And I never really claimed it for myself. And then when I went off to, med to a college, I did what most smart, intelligent, accomplished people do. I said, OK, that spiritual stuff, that's not for me. I mean, I fully subscribed to the religion of the intellect. And I was probably somewhere between a humanist and a rationalist. Uh, but regardless, I absolutely accepted this false choice that we're, we're asked to make, which is you either believe in science or you believe in spirituality. I said, oh, count me in with the science. And so that's how I remained for many, many years. Although in medical school, I think the door started opening just a little bit. Because when I was in medical school, I started really understanding the exquisite detail an intricate interconnectedness of every part of not only our body, but the world, the living world. And so I think deep inside me, there was this little question mark about, wow, is it statistically possible that this is all random, that it's all chance? And over the course of that time, I did also come across a few patients who uh, at the time, I had no idea what they were talking about. Uh, but they shared with me things that were happening to them, whether uh, they were young kids who knew they were going to die during the next operation and told me about the angels who had come to take them. And I will tell you, back then, as now, actually, I just sort of went, well, I don't know about that. That's a, little, that's a little out there, and kind of filed it away. And then I finished, and I got married, and I had a kid, and a kid, and a kid, and I'm a doctor. I should know how that happens. <laughs> uh, but I was really, really busy. I had a full-time job, husband, kids, house, uh, you name it. And like so many people, I was really too busy to even consider my spiritual life or consider that whole realm of existence. And I think it's like most people, because you don't have to think about it until you have to. Most people don't think about death until you're forced to, until you either lose a loved one, or you're diagnosed with a fatal disease, or something. At that point in my life, I had lost no one that I actually knew. No one close to me, no relatives, no friends, no nothing. 
And so I had never actually thought about death as it pertained to me. I'd certainly I had patients die and that sort of thing, but that's a very abstract sort of experience. And <clears throat> that's how I lived. I took my kids to church, but I think I was sort of a cultural Christian in that I took them primarily because I wanted to give them a moral foundation. I wanted to, them to actually understand that there is right and wrong. But it really had little to do with developing their spiritual life. And that all, hap- that all changed for me uh, in 1999. At that point, this is pretty good. I really am using slides. <laughs> at, that, <laughs> at that point, I had these four little kids. And my husband and I decided that they were old enough for us to leave and go on vacation by ourselves, uh, which was incredible. <laughs> I mean, that's a watershed day for anyone. And so we decided to go kayaking in South America. And lest you think that was a bit of a harebrained thing to do, my husband and I are avid kayakers. At that point, we had kayaked for many, many years all around the country, internationally. It was something that was in our, uh, in our experience level. And we went to South America with friends of ours who are professional kayakers. They own a raft and kayak company. They run trips to Chile every year. I mean, this was a routine thing for them. And so we went and had a great time paddling. And what was uh, going to be our last day of paddling anyway, here we are. We loaded up the boats. (laughs) And we decided to paddle on a section of river that's well known for its waterfalls. And when I talk about waterfalls, you know, I'm not talking about Niagara Falls or something crazy like that. But these are drops of 10 to 15 feet, which, you know, maybe as tall as the ceiling. Something that is certainly exhilarating and it's challenging, but really not not a crazy kind of thing. Certainly within our skill set and not something we hadn't done before. And my husband actually woke up that day with terrible back pain. Never had it before, never had it since. And so he didn't go with us. He took us to the river and dropped us off, and then he drove off, and he was going to find a a place to read all day. And he didn't go with us because this part of the river was very, very inaccessible. Southern Chile in 1999 was... uh, I mean, in the middle of nowhere, you might as well be in Antarctica because there was nothing. There were no services. I mean, I live in Wyoming. I understand wilderness. But in Wyoming, in the middle of the wilderness, you can still pull out your cell phone. You can pull out your sat phone. You can call for search and rescue. You can get help. You can get services. In southern Chile at that time, and even now, really, uh, that just didn't exist. We didn't even have cell phones. We didn't have a sat phone. We had no communication. In addition to that, the rivers down there are a little bit different. When you look at this picture, you can see um, the hillsides are very, very steep. They're very thickly covered in bamboo. The section of river was entirely inaccessible and entirely uh, requiring of a complete commitment. Once you put on the river, you (laughs) you were going downstream no matter what. So my husband dropped us off and left, and uh, we were there with a few other American clients, and we all started down the river and went over the first couple drops, and that was fine. And we came to the first major drop, and we sort of talked about how we were going to run it, and there was a smaller aspect to it, smaller shoot. So we decided it was early in the day, we were going to run that first, and this river had, unlike this picture, I mean, the river was very high flow, Uh, high current, high volume. And so I pulled out the current, and it didn't really, it wasn't topologically the same as here. There weren't rocks or things like that to create eddies within the water where you can kind of pull out and regroup. Once you're in the current, you're committed. So I was in the current, going for the smaller chute, all good, until another kayaker sort of bobbled her way past and was sideways in the entrance to this drop. That's a problem. (laughs) You know, when something's across the river, whether it's a boat, log, whatever, it creates a strainer. So the water goes through, but you don't. (laughs) So that's that's a bad thing. And so 
I had no other option but to sort of divert away from this uh, clear problem and be propelled over the, the main part of the waterfall. And when I reached the top, I, I could see the bottom. And I could see tremendous turbulence, tremendous hydraulics. I could not see a clean outflow. And um, you can imagine what I was actually thinking. Uh, but I was thinking, ah, oh, this isn't really going to go so well. <laughs> And I assumed that I would hit the bottom and I'd be flipped upside down, uh, probably wouldn't be able to right myself, I'd have to push myself out of the kayak, be tumbled around a bit and spit out downstream. And it's a miserable experience, but part of kayaking. What happened instead began my transformation in, in earnest. I rocketed down the waterfall, the front end of my boat became pinned or stuck in the rocks and the underwater features and the boat and I were then completely submerged under eight to ten feet of water and <clears throat> I'm a spine surgeon I don't know that I welcome high stress situations but I'm certainly very comfortable with them and so I didn't panic everyone always says oh my gosh didn't you panic and no I'm not really a panicky sort of person but I did go about trying to free the boat trying to free me from the boat it was evident that that was not going to work. And I am a very pragmatic, concrete thinking person. I assumed that I was going to die. I knew that the likelihood of being rescued was slim at best, probably zero. I've seen people die on the river. And I thought about my options, uh, which, which weren't very many, but um, I made a decision to very actively ask that God's will be done. Whatever you want to call God, whoever God is to you. And uh, I will tell you, at that point in my life, when I thought about God, it was like, hmm, I don't know. When I thought about death, it was like, I don't know. I hope there's something more. I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. In that moment, though, I said, okay, I ask that your will be done regardless of what that means. I didn't say, oh my gosh, please, please come and save me. It was truly and sincerely regardless of the outcome. And the moment I asked that, everything shifted. I was immediately uh, being held and comforted and reassured uh, by Christ that everything was fine. I'd be fine, my husband would be fine, my little children that I showed you would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And <laughs> I have to say, I was so wrong. hmm, wow, this is a pretty good hallucination. <laughs> it's not really what I expected, uh, but I went with it. I had this shift in time and dimension so that uh, I felt like every moment expanded into all of eternity. And similarly, all of eternity was contained within each one of those moments that I was underwater. And one of the things we did is go through a, a life review. And, and I have to tell you, again, I, I never really thought about it. If someone had asked me about a life review, I would have assumed it was the Hollywood version. You know, your life flashes across the sky, and you know, you feel really good about some things. You kind of pat yourself on the back, and some things you think, Ugh, I could have done that better. And I would have imagined, you know, that bright light tunnel, I mean, all those things that we see in the movies. But my life review was nothing that I could have imagined. It was everything about love and nothing about judgment, which is really, you know, what, what we're all afraid of. We all blow it. But it had nothing to do with that. We sort of looked at all the events of my life, sort of like swiping left to right on an iPhone going through the photos, and, and Christ would sort of pull out one of those events. And I have to tell you, none of these events were good ones. <laughs> Every event that went by were the most painful, the most traumatic, the most hurtful, the most miserable experiences of my life. And we all have those experiences, right? 
every single one, and every single one he pulled out was really miserable. And it was a, there were events where either I hurt someone I loved or someone hurt me or deeply hurt someone else that I loved. And, and I would find myself immediately back in that experience. And it wasn't just that I re-experienced that event or re-experienced it from my perspective, but I understood me in that situation. And I had an absolute understanding of the other people involved in every event. And, and it wasn't just understanding their perspective. I understood them. I understood everything about their life story, everything about what brought them to that point in time where they hurt me, or I hurt them, or they hurt someone I loved. And what I discovered as we looked at event after event after event is that we all have stories, right? I mean, every time I lash out at someone, and this is trite to say, but it's the truth. Every time, if I'm going to hurt someone, it's because I'm coming from a place of pain. Every single person has a life story. And what I realized is that it's not about forgiveness. When I was in these, you know, re-experiencing these events, it wasn't a matter of, gee, I understood them and I forgave them. Forgiveness, at least as we use it typically, you know, it's like, well, I forgive you, but you're still a jerk. And I forgive you, but I, I do not want to see you again. There's always this two-part equation. But what I realized is that forgiveness is something that we kind of make up. It's this conscious thing. And maybe we feel a little self-righteous about it. Like, huh. Yeah, I forgave that person even though they hurt me terribly. But what I discovered, and what I believe everyone can understand, is that when you have understanding of someone, it's not a matter of forgiveness. It's a matter of grace. Anger, resentment, shame, all of that is replaced by incredible compassion and love and kindness. You know, it's... A, it, it, just as an aside, an example. Two weeks ago, I was on, a, uh, on an airplane, and it's a long, involved story. I was making multiple connections, and the first step of the, this travel log was on this little plane. It had already been delayed an hour. I was just barely going to make my connection, and I was on my way home, so I really wanted to make that connection. And we Finally, we lo loaded on the plane, and we weren't taking off, and we weren't taking off, and I was just thinking, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding. I want to get home. And then there was this kid screaming, and finally, the kid gets brought up to the front of the plane, and the parents want off the plane. And you can imagine, everyone on the plane was rather upset. So they brought the jetway back out, kid and the two parents got off, and then, of course, they had to wait because the stroller and everything else had been gate checked, so we had to wait. And so they pull the jetway away, or they start to. And then I'm looking at my watch and I'm going, okay, I'm definitely going to miss my connection, but if I stay here in this airport, I can get the next flight. So I go up to the front <laughs> and I say, wow, I got to get off this plane. <laughs> so you can imagine. With People were thinking about me, too, but at least I was a little quicker. So they bring the jetway back. I get off. As I'm out there, I see the parents and this kid. And uh, I mean, I will admit, I was a little upset, but there were other people who were really quite cruel. When they were getting off the plane, there were a number of people who made comments that were uh, really pretty biting. And I ended up chatting with these parents, and as it turns out, this kid uh, was a foster kid and had been pulled out of the, this human trafficking ring um, in the Eastern Bloc in Romania. And every time the kid was 
taken to a new abusive situation. He was put on a plane. And I mean, for this kid, putting, being put on a plane meant going further into the depths of misery. And so he refused. He absolutely refused to fly on the plane. Now, in hearing that, how can you be upset, right? All of a sudden, your irritation, because you're not making your schedule, is replaced with incredible compassion and love, not only for this boy, but for the parents. And that's what I found again and again and again. You know, we see the tip of the iceberg when we see people. And we don't have the ability to see their life story. But we know intellectually that they have a life story. And so again and again and again, I was re-experiencing these events of misery, but then realizing that no, actually, I had incredible compassion and love and understanding of these people. And the other thing that happened is I was given this incredible experience of looking at an event and looking at the outcome of that event, not two or three times removed, but when I saw it from a perspective of 25, 30, 35 times removed. And what I discovered again and again and again and again is truly beauty comes of every single event. Totally changed my perception of good and bad because good and bad you know, is, a, is a value judgment, really. But we can all look back at our lives and we can say, wow, that guy, that boy that I was so in love with and broke my heart, it's like, thank God I didn't end up with him. <laughs> I mean, we can all look at that. We can look at jobs we either lost or didn't get or schools we didn't get into. And now looking back, and, and the further back in the past it is, the further we're able to say, wow, I'm so grateful that whatever that was happened. And I could come up with story after story after story, and, and we all can. But it, it actually takes some effort, of course, to look back at your life and, and make note of those things. So I could have stopped there. I mean, pretty good experience already. I mean, life-changing. And I will tell you, though, at the same time, I was still me. I was still my best me. <laughs> I, I still was questioning. I still was, uh, I'm not sure if cynical is quite the wor right word, but certainly uh, skeptical. And I thought about myself, and it's sort of like I was, I was uh, being held and taken through this life review. But then my little thought balloon off to the side, or, you know, I'm like the, the good angel and the bad angel on someone's shoulders. I was over here going, oh, wow, this is not, not really happening. And then I'd be over here, and I'd say, oh, yeah, it really is. I really feel great. I never had an experience of being conscious and then unconscious. I had an experience of being conscious and then more conscious, being alive and then more alive. But my little thought balloon off here kept saying, okay, clearly you're still breathing. And so I would take a minute and I would think about, okay, do I feel air? Do I feel myself breathing? And I'd say, no, no, actually, I am not breathing. And I would think about the time frame, and I'm very good with time. Part of being in medicine is you really need to develop a sense of timing because that really impacts uh, care. And I would say, well, OK. Um, maybe, maybe, and I would try to come up with some other reason why I was still having this experience. And each time I did, I'd say, no, no, actually, you're still underwater. <laughs> I could feel uh, not only uh, this expansive sense of time and reality, but I could still feel the water. I could feel the weight of the water. I could feel the plastic of the boat on my skin. And I could feel the current slowly start to pull my body over the front deck of the boat. And as that happened, I could feel my knees bend back in themselves. And that's not good. <laughs> and I could, I'm in a, 
I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I know what broken bones feel like, and I could feel the bones breaking and tissues tearing. And, and I remember at one point thinking, I must be screaming. And I took a little minute, and I thought, actually, no, I still feel really good. <laughs> and so then my body finally broke free from the boat. And as that happened, my spirit had been kind of peeling away from my body. And, and I rose up and out of the water. And, and I mean, I was free. I was absolutely free. And I was uh, immediately greeted by a group of, uh, I don't know what, people, spirits, beings. Uh, for me, they had physical form, somewhat three-dimensional, head, arms, legs, uh, wearing these uh, incredible robes and really just obviously radiant from within. Not like there was a sun or bright light shining, uh, but from within. And, and it was as though these robes were, I don't know, woven together with fibers of love. I mean, it was... Um, you know, and, it, and I always say when I talk to IONS groups, it's always such a pleasure <laughs> because I don't have to try to explain it. Uh, most of you understand that it's a love that um, is not something we experience here. And it's a love that is pure and complete and tangible. You can feel it. You can see it. You can touch it. And I wasn't coming back. I mean, I looked at my body, recognized it, said, bye, <laughs> I'm not coming back. I felt like I was home. And it was as though, you know, I'd been on a trip to Europe. And, you know, I mean, some of it was great, some of it wasn't so good, but now, you know, I'm home. And these people started taking me up this uh, beautiful path, and I absolutely believe that we are given the experience at the time of our death that will speak to us, that will resonate with us, that will make us feel loved and welcomed. And for me, that's color. It's uh, flowers and the intricacy of flowers and the aromas. It isn't music. It isn't my dog. I mean, I like my dog, but that doesn't speak to me. I know that when my husband, for example, when he dies, he's going to hear beautiful arias and his dogs will all be there and it'll be a very different experience but for me you know i'm, I'm kind of tone deaf i mean i listen to country western music and so listening to arias <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't really make me feel like i was in the right place <laughs> uh, but i was taken along this path that was so beautiful and again it had some physicality to me i didn't have a sense of gravity or anything but it uh, it seemed real. It seemed like a, a path. And it was exploding with color and uh, every color. And again, you know, for those of you who have had NDEs, it's every color, but then also colors that don't exist here. And they were all at the same time. It was as though I could understand each color simultaneously. And we'd get a little bit further down the path, and I could still look back at the scenes at the river. I could see my body. I thought, ooh. That doesn't look so good. <laughs> I mean, I was purple and bloated and fixed dilated pupils. I mean, I was dead as a doornail. Uh, I'd been underwater at, for 30 minutes at that point. Uh, so I thought, <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't look so good. And I could see them start CPR. And I thought, well, I'm sorry, guys. And one of the guys who was only 18, he was kind of a very vulnerable sort of guy. And, I don't, he couldn't see me, but he kept looking exactly where I was. And he said, Mary, please come back. Please come back and take a breath. And I would look at him. And he was so vulnerable. He was so young that I would sort of say, OK, I'll, I'll be right back. And I would go back down this path, and I would lie down, and I would take a breath. And then I would rejoin these people, these spirits. We'd get a little bit further down this path. and. He would start calling again, please, Mary, please come back and take a breath. I'd say, oh, OK, just a minute, I'll be right back. <laughs> and <laughs> what's interesting to me is, I said earlier, I was still me, but it was the best me. You know, we, parts of me, I mean, I am a skeptical person. I just am. 
here on earth, you know, we use that term uh, somewhat derogatorily. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Having, you know, collecting evidence isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I was still, still, you know, coming down this path and going back and back. I mean, I was so frustrated, like, goodbye, like enough. Take a breath means one. <laughs> and I already did it. <laughs> but we would get further down, and finally we came to this archway, this sort of entrance, uh, and it was clearly the point of no return. And I wasn't coming back, and so I kept trying to say, okay, let's get over this line. Uh, but we were there for what felt like many hours, and, and I'm not going to go into it because many of you all have had this experience. I had an absolute understanding, absolute understanding, not necessarily of the nature of the universe, but how it all works, how we can actually all be entirely interconnected. And not just people, people, animals, plants, the entire deal. How it is that we are all one. And I just wanted to stay there forever. And then at a certain point in time, I was told that, you know, it wasn't my time. I had more work to do on Earth, and I'm being kicked out. And I said, no, I'm good. I don't have to go back. <laughs> I had already been reassured that everyone would be fine. So I, I tried to argue my point, but um, I am not an attorney. <laughs> I, I am a doctor. So I was kicked out. And when I sort of revolted, uh, they did start to tell me about some of the work I still had to do. And I have to tell you that it was not a feeling it wasn't a sense of things that I had to do. It was pretty clear cut. It was like, okay, here's this list of things for you. So you better get after it. And I have to tell you that there was nothing on this list, not a single thing, that was something that I thought, oh, great. I can hardly wait. There was no you know, beach house in the Caribbean. There, there was no, there was nothing, not a single thing. Every single thing on this list is something that I knew was going to be very challenging, probably very painful, and definitely not something I felt up for doing. I didn't feel like I had the skills, the knowledge, you name it, this whole list. And some of the things on the list uh, have come to pass, some of them have not yet. But they were all horrible, painful. And outside of my experience would be very difficult to do. I mean, some of it, and I'm not going to get into it uh, this morning, I mean, some of it had to do with the coming and unexpected death of my oldest son. You saw the picture. He was only nine. And I was told about his coming death. And when I asked the obvious question of, well, why? Why my son? Why now? I was immediately taken back to my life review and reminded and shown yet again the reality that beauty comes of all things. And I had been shown that again and again and again. Our job isn't always to know the why. Our job is to recognize that it's there. And then some of it had to do with what I'm doing now, uh, writing, sharing my experience, uh, can't say I w would have signed up for any of that either. Um, and then I was taken back to my body and reunited with my body. And it a, was a long process of getting home. And finally, I mean, I was in dire straits. And I was in the hospital for five or six weeks. I was in rehab for many, many months. And in that initial two-week period of time, there were a lot of things that happened, a lot of miracles. Uh, I had a couple more out-of-body experiences where, again, I believe I was back in heaven. I'm going to call it heaven because, uh, again, as most of you know, there really aren't words. You know, the language isn't there. We have to work and describe things within the 
constraints of her own language. So I'm going to call it heaven. And I was back, and I, it was the same experience of absolute love and intensity of beauty and all of those things. And then after the second one, I was back, and I knew that uh, I wasn't going to be leaving again until I, <laughs> till I get through that laundry list of work. And so then I was left going back to the question, so what? What, what did this mean? And so here I was. This is heaven for me in the first couple of months. They wheeled me over to sunshine. It was like, oh, thank goodness. And that really was the beginning of my trying to figure out what had happened to me. I needed to know what had happened, how this had happened. And I wanted to find a medical scientific explanation. I was desperate to find an explanation. I knew that if I could find a medical, a reasonable scientific exp explanation, then, you know, sadly I'd have to discount the fun part of my experience. But I knew that then I could discount everything I'd been told, including what I'd been told about my son's coming death. And so I was uh, pretty motivated. And I initially, I looked through all my medical records, I interviewed everyone who was at the river and in the emergency room and collected all of that sort of information I could. I did everything. I looked through every original article about so many of the explanations. Um, so, you know, I looked at uh, dreams and hallucinations, but that pretty, I'm going to skip over that because it was pretty obvious that that was not a reasonable explanation. I wasn't asleep. Uh, and then I thought about hypoxia because when I talk to people, that's a pretty common thing. Like, oh, well, it was just, you know, your, your low oxygen levels. I was like, well, I don't think that's it. I mean, zero oxygen is different than low. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I thought, okay. <laughs> But one of the problems is that when you have even just hypoxia, low oxygen levels, you can't make ATP. And ATP is really the, the powerhouse of the, the cells in the body. And that power maintains the cell membrane. And when you can't do that, the cell just sort of gives up the ship. It says, OK, fine. Calcium, out. Neurotransmitters, out. And you have this dumping of both calcium and neurotransmitters. And calcium is extremely toxic to the, the other cells and sort of the brain structure, as are, neurotoxin, or as are neurotransmitters. The other thing is that uh, it destroys the brain cells that are most sensitive to and most responsible for creation of new memories and retention of new memories. So, if I'm going to think that neurotransmitter dumping was responsible for my experience, then I have to discount the science that shows the part of my brain that would have been most likely to be affected was not. But then I focused on the neurotransmitters because that truly is what people look to. And dopamine, we all experience dopamine highs. That's why running and everything else like that is really great, because it creates a euphoria. But it does not create auditory or visual hallucinations. Serotonin isn't really a great thing. If you have too much serotonin, you feel very agitated. You can get seizures. But then I really focused on DMT, because that truly is the darling of, well, I call it darling of my time, because <laughs> DMT is the handy excuse for anyone who wants to discount the reality of near-death experiences. And, and DMT has been called the God particle because it does create a dissociation. It does create a different sense of time and space, and people can have euphoria and uh, hallucinations. But it's very interesting because almost all the DMT experiences have hallucinations that have to do with repeating geometric patterns. They're called machine elves. And it's interesting to me because I think the fact that 
what we describe in near-death experiences as different speaks to the truth of them. As an orthopedic surgeon, I can pretty much tell you what your experience is going to be if you break your arm. There's a little bit difference in terms of pain experience, but it's a physiologic process. I can pretty much tell you what the next six or eight weeks of your life is going to be like. Similarly, with DMT experiences, DMT experiencers can pretty much tell you what the experience is going to be like, the things that you might see, the things that you might hear. But with near-death experiences, you know, we all describe this incredibly intense love, and we all describe incredible beauty, but it's different because we are different. Here on Earth, we describe beauty differently. We experience beauty differently. And so I think it speaks to the truth of them rather than it being a physiologic experience. But with DMT also, you know, we all say, oh, yeah, well, it's found in the pineal gland, and, you know, that releases at the time of death. Well, the fact is it's never been found. Someone found an enzyme that has a capacity to convert a couple of other things to DMT, uh, but they've never actually found DMT in humans. And if they did, it's incredibly toxic, again, to the exact part of the brain that creates and retains new memories. And so I could go on and on and on, uh, but ultimately I had to come to the conclusion that mine was a true and real spiritual experience. It was outside the bounds of medicine, outside the bounds of science. And I also realized this false choice. I mean, we're, we're all, I mean, even today, it doesn't matter what your age, we're expected to choose science or spirituality. But I discovered they coexist very easily because they address different questions. I'm still a scientist. I'm still <laughs> analytical. And I expect science to help me explain how things happen. But I expect my spiritual reality to show me why. And so they coexist very easily. But then, of course, comes back to the same old question. OK, so what? <laughs> so what does my experience have to do? What, does it, what can it do for me? What can it do for other people? And I will tell you that uh, one of the things it did for me was radically change my perception. And this, and you won't be able to do this on a slide, but this is one of those stereotypic 3D images. I don't know if you all remember the Magic Eye books. But it changed my perception so that instead of seeing that as a, an interesting geometric pattern, I look at that and I realize, wow, there's that hidden heart in the middle of it because you can look at it differently. I look at good and bad differently. I don't ever really define things as good or bad anymore. Things are as they are, and I know that beauty will come of every event. I also look very differently at people. And when I look at people, it's as I was saying earlier. I can look at today, which is the top of that iceberg, and that's all I see. That's all I'm able to see. But I can recognize that there's the mass beneath. There's the mass of everything that came before for that person, most of which they don't even understand themselves. And so it totally and radically changes my interaction with other human beings. We talk about love, you know, well, let's love each other and all that stuff. But my question is always, well, what does that even mean? I'm not going to go date everyone. <laughs> but what does that actually mean when we talk about loving each other? And for me, I don't, I don't even use that word very often anymore because it has become meaningless in our culture. But what it means for me is compassion, kindness, respect. I can look at any person that I meet, and they may irritate me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie here. They they may irritate me for whatever reason, or we all have our pet peeves. And whether it's you know a blue blue scarf, you may just think, oh gosh, that really bugs me. <laughs> but 
what we can do and what I can do is I can change my secondary response. I can recognize my own foibles. I can recognize like, oh, come on, get over it. You don't like piercings in an eyebrow. Well, okay, so what? And I can have the grace for myself that then allows me to have grace for that person because I can then look at that person and recognize that they have this backstory, that they have this huge hidden part of their life that has brought them to that moment. And I can recognize that that person is as deeply loved and valued by God as I am. And so all of a sudden it changes things because I can start to feel affection. I can feel love. I can feel respect. I can feel value. And so it changes entirely my, my interaction with people. Obviously, I, like most of you, are, I'm not afraid of dying again. <laughs> I mean, death to me is uh, not, not the point. I mean, death brings context to life. Death brings meaning to life. But when I think about death, I think about this. It's my airplane ticket to home. This is the vacation. This is the great adventure. And then I get to go home. And the people I've met on my great adventure, well, you know, they're sorry that I'm leaving. And I'm sorry to leave because during my adventure, I love people. I make great friends. But I also know that I'm going home to where I've lived my whole life. I'm going home to the people who have loved me as long as I've existed. And so my concept of death has radically changed. And I, I have to admit, that's not always a good thing. It's very difficult, actually, for me to um, express culturally acceptable sadness when a friend's parent dies. <laughs> or when there's death, I mean, we're expected to be, oh my gosh, that's so terrible. But I have to tell you, a little part of me is thinking, oh, lucky? <laughs> I mean, so not all the changes are, are culturally um, acceptable. And as we talk about transformation, uh, because again, that's the theme of this, I will tell you, my transformation has changed everything. The after effects for me changes who I am. I mean, before all of this, I probably would have said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a surgeon, I'm all those sorts of labels. And now I would say that I am a spiritual being. I am a child of God. I am love. And yes, in addition to that, okay, if you want to label me, yes, I'm a wife and a mother and all those things. But it's totally changed my perception of who I am and who each of you are. I mean, I don't care what job you have. I don't care if you're married. I mean, you know, I do because it's interesting. But the most important label any of us have is as spiritual beings. It's changed what I do. I mean, I'm still a surgeon, I'm still a mother, I'm still, I'm still all those things. But it's changed what I do because I know that even when I see patients in my office, I'm not really there primarily to try to help them deal with their physical ailment. I am there to help them deal with their spiritual growth. And so it's changed what I do. It's changed how I live, radically. And I, I'm not going to tell you that I was a jerk before, and now I'm not a jerk. I mean, I, I certainly always bought into the concept of being a good person, being honest and ethical and a woman of integrity and all those sorts of things. But how I live is very different. I live entirely in the moment. Um, I'm not held back by my past. I'm not held back from my future by fear. I am able to be entirely present here, in this moment, because this is the moment that matters. My past, whether I did great things or terrible things, it's gone. It may have 
brought me to where I am today, but in terms of its potential to define who I am or what my future is, it doesn't exist. I'm free from regret, shame, anger, you name it. And I'm able to live freely because I also don't have worry or anxiety about tomorrow. I still plan, but I know that if my plans don't come to fruition, it's okay. There's something that's probably even greater waiting for me. And it's changed why I live. I mean, I live to reflect God's love to this world. That's it, in a nutshell. And I think most of you who have had NDEs would agree with that. That's why we're here. We are here to help other people get it together. <laughs> you know, like figure out that the spiritual world is here and now. And that's our primary purpose. And so why I live is very different. Sure, I, you know, I am here because my Kids would be sad if I weren't there and all that sort of thing, but the why is very, very different. And so the after effects for me have been uh, significant. And so, okay, I have to show this last slide only because uh, my son taught me how to use Photoshop. (laughs) But, But this is a great summary. I mean, basically, I think that what is available for every person, not just people who have had profound experiences, but every single person has the ability to work through their life, work through collecting evidence of the spiritual realities and the spiritual truths, and be able to draw the same picture for themselves. Basically, being set free from that ball and chain of your past. And some people have very, very challenging pasts. And I have spoken with many thousands of people at this point who have lost children, who have had serious illnesses, who have had something, abuse, something in their past that keeps pulling them back and makes them remain in their past. And I think part of that is because they haven't come to the point of recognizing that whatever that is, it's okay. Everything in the past that has created anger, shame, guilt, remorse, all those things, you can be set free from that. And you can be set free by recognizing the reality of the spiritual world and recognizing how people have been transformed to get to the point of saying that I am a spiritual being. I'm not my job, my mother, or my wife, all that sort of thing. And, And you can kind of let worry and anxiety float away. You certainly don't have to worry about death. And what that means ultimately is living in a state of joy. And joy, of course, is very different from happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Happiness you know, I make my, my plane connection. I mean, happiness is based on everything superficial, as is sadness. But joy is really a state of being, and joy is based on a recognition of the truth of everything I've been talking about, the truth of the spiritual realm, the truth of God's promises to us, the truth that grace is covering our past, the truth that there really is life after death. If you accept nothing except the fact that there really is life after death, and I think at this point, people who don't accept that are either intellectually arrogant or spiritually lazy, one of the two, because there is so much evidence that points to the continued consciousness after death. If you accept nothing but that, that radically changes your experience of today. It it actually makes it a little more important, which I think is why many people don't want to accept it. Because if you recognize that there really is something more, then all of a sudden, it means today is something more. 
but I think that if you can release your past and release the future, then that truly is the secret to living today in a state of joy that transcends all circumstances, that allows you to face struggle, challenge, heartbreak, heartache, with a continued sense of joy because of where your focus is, because of who you are, and because of the reality that this is a great adventure, but it's not our home. <laughs>